might not have prepared myself well enough to be attractive for some of the most pop, most, um, top tier schools. week's episode of the mixtape with Scott, I had the pleasure of interviewing Kyle Kretschmann, the head of economics at the streaming platform Spotify. Before I dive into the interview, though, I wanted to give you a bit of a heads up about the sound quality. Unfortunately, the sound quality in the interview on Kyle's side is a bit muffled. We discussed refilming it, tried to find a way to tweak it, but there were certain constraints on the actual sound itself that kept us from being able to do it. And we didn't feel that refilming it would be good because we thought that the interview had a lot of serendipitous kind of spontaneous tangents and things spoken about that we thought students and people in academia would want to know, would need, maybe even need to know. And I doubted that I could recreate it um, cause I don't even know why it happened. So I'm going to post a video version of this at my sub stack. Um, for those who feel that a video version would help them, uh, kind of follow it in so far as the audio might be at times challenging. So check out the sub stack, uh, for those of you that want to watch, uh, watch it instead of just, uh, listen to it. Um, uh, hopefully that'll help. <clears throat> I won't say much here by way of introduction, uh, except to say a few things about Kyle because I wanted to let Kyle tell you his story in his own words, because it's his story to tell, and it's an interesting story. Kyle's a PhD economist, though, from the University of Texas, Austin, which is down the road from where I live and work at Baylor, uh, where he wrote on topics in graduate school in applied econometrics, empirical industrial organization, or empirical IO, and public choice. <clears throat> After graduating, Kyle went to Amazon, not academia. Um, in fact, Given we might start the boom of tech hiring PhD economists in the early to mid 2010, 2010s, uh, you could say Kyle maybe was sort of one of the earlier hires among that second wave of PhD economists that went there. He worked for several years at Amazon before being hired away by Spotify to head up and lead a new economics team there. Perhaps this is part of a broader trend of tech firms building up more internal teams, not just of data scientists, but like Amazon departments of economists, who knows? Uh, recall though, from an earlier interview with Susan Athey, uh, where when I asked Susan why she said Pat Bajari had done something amazing at Amazon, she said he made economists productive. And in time, he made many of them productive and very productive from what I've been able to follow. And Kyle is, from what I can gather, someone whose skills uh, matured and deepened under the leadership of Pat Bajari at Amazon and other leaders at, uh, and other economists at Amazon. Uh, and he was ultimately hunted down by a major tech term to create an economics team there. I'm by no means an expert on the labor market for PhD economists. Uh, I just have been very intrigued and curious by um, the, 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 mar the labor market for PhD economists in tech because, well, partly because of realizing um, first that causal inference was really valued in tech, but then to sort of realize that there was just this very large community of economists there. Um, but I don't think it's controversial to say over the last 10 to 15 years, the tech industry really has been disruptive in the labor market for PhD economists. They continue to hire uh, at the junior and senior market uh, in larger and larger volume selecting more and more on people who likely would have gone into academia, into tenure track or tenured positions. Um, they pay very high wages, some of the very, some of the highest wages in the country, both at the junior level and especially at the, at the higher end, at the, uh, at the more advanced levels. People can uh, earn uh, compensation packages uh, by, the, in the, by the time they're in their 30s that many of us uh, didn't know were possible. Uh, it's in my mind historically novel, and I might be wrong about this, but it, it seems historically novel that the PhD economists who likely would have produced academic research papers uh, in tenured and tenure track jobs have begun to branch out of academia, but maintain those skills and maintain that research output. 
Uh, it's partly driven, best I can tell, by Amazon. I might be wrong, but by Amazon and Papajari, as well as Jeff Bezos' own view that economists are what I guess we would just say value added for many firms. Uh, therefore, I'm continuing to want to speak with economists in tech to help better trace out the story. Uh, this interview with Kyle follows uh, on the back of earlier interviews with people in tech like John List, uh, you know, a, a distinguished professor of economics at the University of Chicago, but also the former chief economist at Lyft and Uber and now Walmart. Michael Schwartz, uh, former professor of economics at Harvard, now chief economist at Microsoft, and Susan Athey, former chief economist at Microsoft, professor at Stanford, and now chief economist at the DOJ. I hope you find this to be an interesting dive into the industry, learn a little bit more about economists there, but by, by learning the, about one particular important economist there, a, a young man named Kyle Kretschmann, head of economics at Spotify. My name's Scott Cunningham, and this is The Mixtape with Scott. Well, it's uh, my pleasure today to have as my guest on The Mixtape uh, with Scott, Kyle Kretschmann. Uh, Kyle, thanks so much for being on the call. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate the time to talk. Well, before we get started with your career and, and everything, I was wondering if you could just tell us your name and your title and where you work. Sure. Yeah, as you said, I'm Kyle Kretschmann. I'm the head of economics at Spotify. Head of economics at Spotify. Awesome. Okay, I can't wait to talk. So let me, um, let me, let's get started. I was wondering if you could just tell me where you grew up. Sure. So most of the time I grew up in, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, about an hour north of the city, real real small town, probably had one stoplight. Um, and maybe the the funny story that I can share is when I took my wife there, she asked, where's the Starbucks? And I said, no Starbucks here. There's no Starbucks. So, <laughs> yeah, so pretty small town called uh, Chippewa Township in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. Is that near like Amish stuff or anything like that? No, that's the other side of the state. So this would be Western Pennsylvania, about uh, uh, near the end of the turnpike, about five minutes from the Ohio border. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, you said, but you, did you mention you kind of grew up in different places? Yeah. So before that, um, my father worked in civil engineering and so would do ro build roads and bridges basically across every, across the nation. So I was actually born in Louisiana, uh, lived there, with, I think for a whole two, three weeks. <laughs> I don't quite remember because I was yeah. pretty young, obviously. But then Michigan and then spent some time in uh, Philadelphia before moving out to Pittsburgh around uh, second grade. Oh, that's kind of like um, that's like when people describe their parents being in the military, just kind of moving around a lot. Yeah, a little bit. So, But then uh, you settled in the second grade. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So outside of Pittsburgh and then stayed in Pittsburgh through high school and even through undergrad. So, oh, OK. Yo, you went to undergrad in Pennsylvania? Yeah, I did. So I went to undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, oh, it yeah. was, yeah, if um, I guess maybe continuing the story, growing up in a town with no Starbucks, I was I was pretty intrigued by going to a city <laughs> and yeah. trying out that lifestyle. And yeah, we might have lived pretty close, like an hour away, but we didn't go down to the city very much. So um, Pittsburgh was just really, really enticing for a city to uh, for to go to undergrad in. And so I basically looked at all schools that were in cities. And mm -hmm. so the proximity plus then the the ability to just um, spread my wings and explore what it's like to be in a city was really, really enticing. Did any of your friends go to Pitt with you? Yeah, so there's probably, I grew I graduated from a class of about two, a little over 200 people in high school. And I think there was like five or six people from high school that went to Pitt for my class. Mm -hmm. So definitely had some really good friends who went and uh, kept in touch with through undergrad. Mm, yeah. So it wasn't, were you sort of an early generation or you weren't, were you a first generation college student in your family or did your parents go to college? Uh, combination. So my dad went to Penn State, uh, civil engineer, as I mentioned. Uh, me and my mom actually graduated from undergrad the same week. So my mom wow. went back to school uh, later in life um, after me, after we went to school. And so, yeah, we, we were able to celebrate graduation because she went to a small private school right outside of the city also. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, so what did you like to do in high school? So I played a lot of sports before high school. And then I kind of switched into, and this was a traditional sports of football, basketball, baseball. But then I switched into tennis in high school. Mm. Um, and so that kept me busy. But along with a lot of academics and really, really liked computer science. Uh, mm. So played a lot of video games growing up. Um, really enjoyed like that aspect and combination. 
what games were your were you did you play on a on a video game pla- uh, platform like a Nintendo or did you play computer? Yeah, no, we played a lot of PlayStation. Uh, very much into like role playing games, some of the um, arcade games like Marvel vs. Capcom. So yeah. yeah, very very interested in uh, gaming. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. and yeah. yeah, maybe maybe I was a little too early for that because you know every, everybody in the 1990s was like. Oh, I could make po- money playing video games, which wasn't right. true back. Which wasn't <laughs> true back then. Yeah, but that's right. You know, yeah. nowadays, you can. That's right. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. uh, that's right. You can do it. There's all kinds of ways you can make money doing things today that nobody knew was possible ten year, ten or fifteen years ago. Even. That's right. Um, that's cool. Yeah, I, I. It's funny, you know. Uh, computer games can keep a keep a kid in high school. Uh, going you know mm-hmm. like yeah. especially i think they're kind of misunderstood i i had a lot of friends uh that well i mean i i had when i didn't have a lot of we moved from a small town in mississippi to um memphis and i those those that first year when i didn't have a lot of friends i did uh, bulletin boards and played uh sierra online mm-hmm. games like king's quest and it's like it's like, you know, not intertemporal smoothing, but like intertemporal socializing smoothing, you know, so that I you mean, can just kind of get through some periods that would otherwise be a little lonelier. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I mean, for this audience, like most video games are some sort of form of constrained optimization. So <laughs> there was there was the inkling that I I liked understanding how economies work uh, mm. in high school through this and um yeah going back to my mom my mom always said like she encouraged it and she encouraged education and there was actually kind of like that nexus whenever i took economics in high school it was like oh you know some of these games really are full economies that are constrained and constrained in a way that you can understand and complete in you know under 100 hours but um there was that combination that was kind of showing itself of computer science computer games and economics all putting itself together so you were kind of thinking even in high school about economics in that kind of like, you know, optimizing something and like, like almost that modern theory that we get in graduate school. I think more, I had the intuition when I didn't have know how to say what it was in high school, because my high school was um, pretty forward and that it offered both advanced computer science courses that could get mm-hmm. you through definitely through first year of undergrad, but maybe even through second year with mm-hmm. advanced placement. And then they also offered advanced placement economics. Mm-hmm. And so I, I ended up taking advanced placement economics my junior year, when wow. I took it senior year. And so even whenever I was going- Even in that small town? Even yeah. in that small town, they had, you had good, your high yeah, school it was, good econ? It, yeah, it was, a real, it was a really good high school that would put together good curriculum that did a lot of college preparatory work. Um, so oh, they- wow. They really leaned into the advanced placement, uh, the AP courses to get students ready to go to school. Wow. Wow. So even as a junior, you're taking AP Econ, you know, you don't have to take AP Econ. That kind of is say that that sounds like somebody that was kind of interested in it. Yeah, very much. Yeah. And again, as soon as I I definitely didn't get to the graduate level of understanding like, you know, Lagrange multipliers, but the, the micro and macro sequence just made intuitive sense to me. Mm. Um, it was like, it was kind of where I was like, yeah, this fits and this is how I think. And some people might criticize me now that I think too much like an economist, right? <laughs> like my, but at the same time, it just like, it started to put together that language and even more so some of the framework that yeah. really kind of drew me into it. Well, did you, did you, uh, did you notice that you had this interest in computer science and this interest in economics and that they might be what did you get a feeling that they could be in conversation with each other you not know, at first our ancestors a yeah. hundred years ago didn't you know those economists didn't think that way but now it's just so natural for this generation of economists to be almost one half you know one third mathematician one third economist one third computer scientist yeah so not at first but i, I feel like i may have like lucked into it honestly um mm-hmm. because whenever i chose to go to Pitt, i chose to start as computer science um, because I knew what that path was. I was inspired by my older brother, the great teacher in high school. And like, I was definitely like, okay, a software, software development engineer career is great. It's cutting edge. It's there. 
But after probably like the first year, it just didn't feel that end state didn't feel right. And so I made kind of the hard decision to choose, honestly, to switch into economics as a major because I wasn't sure what the end state would be <laughs> or right. where I was going with it because it was definitely felt more amorphous. Um, you know, it's a social science. So yeah. it didn't feel like it was going to be um, as clear cut and as and have as much certainty. But pretty quickly, like after a year, it was like, oh, well, we're doing we're using e-views at the time. All right. This is coding. I know how to do this. This is great. Right. And starting starting to see some of that in undergrad was like the kind of the aha moment that like, yeah, this is this is a place where I can apply this love of coding and problem solving but on problems and solutions that I find really, really hard and interesting. It was because of econometrics though? It was in that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's really interesting because, you know, I think it's still the case that, you know, uh, you can easily end up with an econometrics class that remains purely theoretical mm -hmm. and doesn't end up uh, you know, exposing the student with a lot of actual coding, but it sounds like your professors were were getting you into working with data. That's correct. Yeah, both yeah. both within the class. So, like I said, we used eViews at the time. Yeah. And again, kind of like learning as you go. I, I don't think I really knew what I was doing when right. we, were, we were typing commands and eViews, but the computer scientist in me was like, okay, well, this is a function. I know functions, input output, mm -hmm. but definitely didn't understand necessarily things that were going under the hood or, you know, right. all of the theory that goes with it. Oh, um, right. Right. So it was, you knew the coding part, you knew you were coding, but you did, but like the, the actual statistical modeling was kind of the new part, but that was a way for you to kind of engage it a little bit. Yep, exactly. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, um, so what were you going to have to choose between a computer science and an econ major did, or did you end up doing both? So I chose an econ major, but then I had what I would call basically minors or concentrations in computer mm -hmm. science, but then also in statistics and also in math, because mm -hmm. once once I had an internship at a bank and was doing data entry and I was like, eh, I don't think this is what I want to use my economics degree for. Yeah. Um, I had a couple of professors at Pitt named Steve Husted and Frank Giratani who brought me on as a research uh, assistant, an undergrad to start mm. being part of some of like their survey projects and data collection. And even, even one of them, I don't see was crazy, but he even let me TA a class as an undergrad. So, oh, wow. <laughs> but he kind of, I mean, I, I say that jokingly because it was formative for me. It was like, okay, this is great. How do I do more of this? And he's like, well, you go get your econ PhD. Mm. And I was like, so I can be a teacher with computer science and doing economics all together. He goes, yeah, let's do that. And so mm. it was with, the help and support of some of these really good professors in this education that kind of pushed me on this path to, to consider to get an econ PhD. Mm. And that's when you were like, so how, how, what, what year would you have been in your program? Probably, I think I was in my junior year where I was starting to explore this. And then in my senior year is where I was like, okay, I'm actually going to be doing more, more of this and applying to grad school because mm. Going back, as I said, I entered with some credits, so my senior year was very, I didn't need a full course load, so I was looking for <laughs> other things to keep me busy, which maybe maybe that's one of the themes of this conversation is I kind of kind of like the variety and really have variety yeah. seeking behavior, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you graduate. Was there like a field that you were mostly interested in? <laughs> uh, I thought I would be going into macroeconomics. Macro, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because Steve worked on the Council of Economic Advisors, and I was really inspired by that and the application of economics within um, within policy, and just again always applied economics, not necessarily theoretical. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So then again, it was that would be sort of like labor macro was like the initial idea, but finally, Scott, I didn't do all my homework and like think about like what <laughs> grad school looked like or all it looked like. I kind of went a little bit more naive than I think other people with. Um, again, ideas of how I could become like a teacher or an educator with some of these tools um, versus like how disciplined and single threaded you need to be on research to be within an econ PhD program and to see that. So you, so you kind of were like, so when you were thinking about graduate schools, what, how, what, what did you sort of, can you walk me through like what you were thinking and how you went about trying to apply to graduate school and where you ultimately chose? 
Yeah, sure. So applied probably the the top 10 and the top 10 probably said, <laughs> no, thanks. But right. also then was targeting specific schools that we had a uh, relationship with that I knew would provide um, computer science and macro. So mm -hmm. University of the Iowa time, at the time, so this was 2006, um, had a really strong macro program. And then also at the University of Texas with Dean Corbet there, um, they also have one in Russ Cooper. And so those were like the two that I was like targeting at, outside of what the top schools were. But yeah, as I, I kind of mentioned, I, I might not have prepared myself well enough to be attractive for some of the most top most, um, top tier schools because kind of, you know, as I said, bounced around and would be yeah. a little bit working on a little bit different things and have some right. computer science versus being solely focused on like economics and math and things that might be uh, more of what the top tier schools were looking for. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, it's like um, the, I mean, I'm the same way. Uh, I didn't ha have any econ classes in college. I was a English major, but um, the, the, the diff, there's so many students that sort of seem to almost for whatever reason, know a lot sooner what they want to do and then like make those choices. And then there's just many of us that are, you know, in a process of search. And yeah. when you're in a process of search, uh, well, you, you know, by definition, that's like you're using that time to search. That's exactly you know, right. As yeah, opposed to just... saying, I've got to take, uh, I've got to become a triple major, computer science, math, econ, and have to do like, you know, these the set of the set of steps that, you know, there's no way I could even have known to do it uh, unless somebody had told me. It's weird. I mean, it's just funny how the little things can have such big repercussions for your whole life. But it's but it, it worked out great. You so you end up where do you end up going? I went to the University of Texas at Austin. Yeah. yeah. What year was that? And so, so this would have been 2006, 2007. Oh, okay. So you go 06, 07. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so, and, um, so I ended up working a lot with Jason Abravaya. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, who came in and became the, the head of the department. Yeah. Um, applied econometrician who just did an amazing job going back to whenever I said I didn't know how things worked under the hood in those formulas. He didn't even let us use those formulas. <laughs> so anytime we were doing applied econometri uh, econometrics with them, not only were we learning to teach, we're learning the theory, but he said, you have to code it yourself. Uh, you have to do the matrix algebra. You have to calculate the standard errors. You can't really call those functions. So mm -hmm. that was probably, again, that wasn't until the third year. But yeah, in the first year, um, to go I back a little bit. I bet that played to your I, strengths, though. I bet that played to your strengths. Of yeah. just at the end of the day, wanting to be someone that, that wrote down the raw code. That's exactly right. And But the first year, it didn't play to my strengths. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. the first year, I felt, I felt a little bit out of water. Um, and I was like, this is... I remember when we were proving what local non satiation and I was like, this is, this is one hard, but also like, again, going back to like that computer, is this actually how I want to be spending my time? And right. I, I was like, yes, I do. But I was like, I, I knew that I needed to get to those applied applications. Yep. And so that's again, why I was thankful to be able to work with Jason and Steve Trejo and yep. um, a few other of the applied econometricians at, at Texas that, really encouraged me to explore starting in the yeah. second year they yeah. didn't want to like pin it down and so i thought i at, at the second year i worked like wrote the first a paper on school choice and trying to see if i could find some sort of instrument on school selection on private public versus private and again so that led to like that idea of like applied econometrics was oh, really okay. really the thing that like I was like, okay, now this fits again. Once we got into the second and third year, was, was picking up that intuition, that kind of like labor style uh, identification, causal inference kind of approach. Was that something you picked up from Jason, or was that just like from your yeah. labor people? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah from Jason and Steve a lot. Um, they did yes, a great Steve. job of doing that, right. and yeah. So that's then, cool. yeah, then I then yeah. I threw in I knew I threw a little bit of a switch in there also, and. Um, my co-author, Nick Mastronardi, and closest friend and classmate in Texas, was very theoretical and very interested in applied empirical I.O. And so we started working in that field also together. And cool. so then I got to work with Eugenio Miravetti and Ken Hendricks on uh, using empirical I.O. So, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And so 
again this is the more more structural more structural econometrics so you've got this like reduced you've kind of got this like uh traditional labor reduced form type uh part of your brain and then you've got this empirical io structural part of your brain kind of emerging at the same time that's right that's exactly Mm -hmm. right yeah and then we threw we threw everybody for a loop by also saying we wanted to study uh, study politics and how money turns into vote using votes using all these tools so yeah, I can sit here kind of saying in hindsight, like it all makes sense in this story that I'm telling you. But at the time, it was more what you were talking about. It was searching. It was, I want to be working on really interesting applied problems. I mm-hmm. love the toolkit that economics provides and framing. And yeah, I have to be coding um, to be able to utilize these tools that I've had built up in the past. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so matching with Nick was really important. Very was much. And. Well, yeah, well, why? If you hadn't matched with Nick, well, I mean, just kind of out of curiosity, if you could articulate the value added of that whole partnership, what was it? Yeah, sure. So uh, we matched basically from math camp going into going into the first year because Nick came both from the pure math and physics background and also had some experience in the Air Force. So um, the Air Force was sending him to Texas and he... Um, we were we were definitely we definitely didn't have a lot of then overlap on the fact he's like, well, I would have the intuition and some of the computer skills. Nick would have the theoretical math the skills. Theoretical math skills, yeah. And then we just had we had the common factor that we wanted to work hard together and learn together, and we're willing yeah. to <laughs> we're willing to intellectually hash out really tough things together. Yeah. So um, yeah, he, huge credit to him um, through being able to put up with me. And he says, he says the same thing once in a while, but again, matching with somebody that had the, the more real analysis, proof based understanding of math was mm-hmm. so valuable for me. And especially I think some... empirical IO, especially empirical IO, just being able to, you know, think like an economist in the area of IO is thinking real deep about, you know, a rich set of models and modeling that's, approaches. That's yeah, exactly right. That's yeah. definitely not what you're learning in your, econometrics classes even That's though right. they might go together mm-hmm. yep yeah. so so yeah it was just a, it was a really good match from the beginning um and so we complemented each other and we're we're able to build a strong enough relationship to uh be able to be able to hash out and have really long nights yelling at each other we say in the office mm-hmm. but it never it was always for uh educational purposes and lifting each other up was that different than what you thought grad school was going to be like uh yeah so I knew the research component a little bit. I just didn't under, understand the unstructured research uh, and how that was going to go and like the cadence and where it was going to and how that was going to be so required to develop your own um, viewpoint. Yeah. Um, I thought it would be more directed because um, as a 22 year old, that was the experience I had generally. So mm-hmm. that was the big one was the undirected. And I liked it, but it was also very difficult. How would you describe what you're talking about to your uh, college self who kind of like, you know, he he doesn't really, he doesn't even have the vocabulary for what you're describing. What would you say it was like? Um, I think you use a good term. You have to be not only wanting to search, you have to be willing to search, but you also then, you have to put in the guardrails yourself to keep it focused because, um, you're not necessarily going to have those external guardrails that you will have from an alternative path of going to either like a master's program that's going to be more structured or going into industry or going to get a job, right? Like I mentioned at the bank for like yeah. a 22 year old where entry level jobs are going to be more structured. Yeah. So yeah, I just, I, I probably knew it, but I didn't know what it meant to be and what to, what it meant to experience it. So how did Jason and, and Steve kind of, and, and any other faculty, how, how do they, how do they, I, so I did this interview with Susan Athey and she was saying that, you know, the amazing thing that Pat Bajari did at Amazon was he managed to make economists productive. <laughs> it, was kind of, it was kind of a weird, weird way of saying it. Uh, and so in a way, it could, in a way you could imagine a department that sort of has like a, you know, this idea of like research has got to come. There's like a, there's like a, uh, a journey that a graduate student has to come on to just to basically make a decision to be a researcher. Yeah. You know, and you could imagine uh, that 
creating the conditions for that is is uh, involves faculty member doing stuff that's not necessarily obvious. What, how did they? How do you think they contributed to that for you personally? For me personally, at the time, again, it goes back to encourage the exploration versus um, mandating or saying that I need to be on one path. Mm. So, like, even Nick and I at the time explored the idea of a private company and how what what that would be into like pitching pitching a venture capitalist on on that. Mm -hmm. So, um, all those things again in grad school they they were encouraged, but they weren't structured at the time. Yeah. So, yeah, I can I can. I understand Susan's comments because I was I was one of those economists who started pretty early with Pat, and yeah. we have we have a lot of good mechanisms that we've learned and built at Amazon when I was there at the time through Pat and through the other people who are willing to make the jump into this entrepreneurial space that hit the coalescence and the of coalescence of economists doing open book empirical research along with data science. Right. Just becoming more and more valuable and applicable. That is kind of what Susan's highlighting. That yeah, we can, we can talk more about if you want. Yeah, I do want to talk about that. I want to talk about the the decision, though. You know, uh, to to bet you because you you sort of started off in college. You know, you said things like, "Oh, you can become an educator," mm -hmm. right? and then you've gone in this non-academic direction, and you know, it, it and that's like a that's a more common story now. You know, right. uh, of of uh, top talent, very talented PhDs uh, that you could have easily seen twenty years ago would have been in academia. Their counterfactuals are are following you, and mm -hmm. so you know it's it's a it's a big part of our you know collective story as economists that this this new labor market that didn't that didn't exist historically now exists and draws in so much talent. And I was just curious, in a way, you're kind of like a, a first generation person like that, you know, when you think about it, right? Because tech's not very old. Right. Facebook, Facebook uh, what, it's like 2007. And so, you know, so you've got this, um, you, you, you've got this, this chance to kind of say, like, it must have been, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I guess I was just wondering, what were the feelings like as you considered not taking an academic track? And when did it start to be something in your mind that you thought that's going to be something I'm going to explore? Uh, probably pretty early, because if you want to really trace the roots of like tech economists back, it starts obviously with Hal Varian at Google. And uh, me and Nick actually, we, we sent an email to Hal probably in 2008 saying, do you have any have any use for some summer interns who can oh, do really? some empirical IO? And he said, no, not, not at this time. But so but he answered the email. He did answer the email. Yeah, it was nice, <laughs> nice of him to answer because we know he was probably pretty busy. Um, but so it honestly, when Amazon started hiring economists, I was probably searching for about a year to move into tech. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to move back to the decision point coming out of grad school, honestly, it was a challenging labor or a challenging job market for me. Um, Somebody who is a lover of variety, who is working on empirical I.O. problems with campaign policy, campaign finance reform, uh, policy recognition, that's, that's not fitting a lot of the standard uh, yeah. application process, yeah. which, again, that's, that's probably a theme for me. And again, at the time, it was hard. Um, I, was, I was in the running for jobs at Vassar Wake Forest that I thought would be really good fit. Because mm -hmm. there, the edu the emphasis would be on education with the research um, ability to do research and work on uh, problems that were more widely probably policy oriented. Yeah. Uh, but neither neither of them came through. So um, I just always knew that I, industry was going to be an option. And mm -hmm. so, what year is this? What what this what would have been in this would have been in twenty eleven. Twenty eleven. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, so you moved through the you moved through the program kind of relatively quickly. Oh, five seven, years. Four, 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 five, five years. Okay. Five years. Yeah. Five years. Yeah. Oh, six to 11. Okay. Um, but so for about oh, a year. Yeah. yeah. And so starting in 2013 is whenever I started applying to the first tech job as a data scientist and God, it went great until I talked to the VP who was uh, a business part, like pure business person. When I was talking to the hiring manager at the time, um, it was a company who was providing college counseling as a software service. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And so they would do this, uh, their, their clients were both for-profit and not-for-profit companies. And we were talking, like we'd get into details about treatment effects models and how we could measure the impact of the intervention. It went great. But then I had the fly out scheduled, but then the interview with the VP, he said, well, how am I going to monetize your algorithm? Right. And I was like, I'm not sure. I know what algorithm means, but (laughs) I, I wasn't prepared for that language and that application and how you turn econometric modeling and measurement into, into business impact at the time. Right. So spent another year looking around with different opportunities like that and honestly learning again. So, so whenever Amazon, so this would have been in 2014 and then Amazon was hiring its first, first big cohort with Pat. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was a cohort that was about, I think there was about 13 of us. It was a no brainer. Um, uh, whenever, whenever we did the interviews, it just was like, all right, this is exactly right for me. Uh, right. I was hope I was hoping it was right on the other side. And I couldn't probably tell you some funny stories about the interview process, but um, I was like, this is this is what's meant to be. Yeah. So it, it it was like a ten year journey from 2004 when I switched out of computer science into 2014, being like, this just this fits. Right, right, right. Uh, so out of curiosity, you know, is is there is there something that you think is supposed to be learned by the fact that when you were on the job market and you had that interview with that that gig and the and you get to the VP and he articulates questions that are not traditional econ questions or even econometrics questions like business profitability to act, it's kind of ironic isn't it like to everybody that's not an economist that's actually what we they think we do you know it's yeah. like they think we do all that stuff and then they don't know that we're like like you said uh you know trying to set up a Lagrangian and solve, and solve it. <laughs> <laughs> like, a, what's a Lagrangian? But um, uh, do you think your competition at that time did know how to answer questions like that, like non-economists in those positions? Uh, probably at an inflection point, yeah, because this is the same time wherever machine learning is becoming a more common toolkit with an industry. So... Mm-hmm. There would be like machine learning algorithms that are designed for, you know, prediction problem sequencing, um, anything like that, that are specifically designed to be used in a business setting to monitor. So they, they not only know machine learning, it's like they also can kind of immediately articulate why this would be profitable. I think so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because again, the, the computer, so it's like in learning the language, and this is a language that would probably be more understood within a machine learning computer science version is okay well i'm going to use this to change the recommendation engine right is a right. very common one yeah that's obviously going to be so how are you going to obviously monetize good. it i'm going to improve the match in the recommendation engine it's going to have this so i think at the time there was a little bit of it but yeah. you know hopefully i think i think i learned pretty quick that um yeah. you can you can use econometrics in a similar vein as, as i said it's a flavor of data science have you had to become a blue collar machine learner I've had to understand it, but not, uh, I think you mean by blue collar, you mean like implementing it. And... Yeah, I just, when I, I usually say blue collar in the sense of like, you know, you don't like, you know, you basically are picking up these skills, uh, at, but you weren't like, you know, you, you didn't get a PhD in computer science, you know? The answer is yes. The, the, you know, then that answer is definitely yes. So like as we, as a cohort and as we grew the economic discipline, at Amazon, that was a big part of it is how, one, could we bring in some machine learning scientists to help educate and teach us? Mm. And yeah, so, and even in sometimes in lecture style, we would do that because it was so important. But then even more so, um, learning to, so that you can interact with different stakeholders, specifically like machine learning scientists, mm. uh, and then um, understanding when you can actually implement it and marry it within the econometric models was definitely a huge part of the education process. So you go to Amazon, is that right? That's like your That's first right. entry into tech. That's right. Is Amazon. What's your title? So Scott, is it a scientist time, or economist? I, it was something like business intelligence engineer. There wasn't an economist job family. There was, it, as you said, it was kind of the forefront. I, I think it was this. Yeah, I think that's what it was. But Because um, it is the, now, right? Bajari has a. That's a, right. Yeah. He created a job title called economist. 
That's right. Yeah. And that got set up about a year in. Um, so oh. like, and I was part of the group that um, we would set these, we set up like these people and process mechanisms that allowed economists to be so influential and productive within the Amazon. Mm. Okay. So how is he doing it? Why, why is Susan saying he performed a miracle by making economists productive? Can you kind of describe like, if you had to just guess at like the counterfactual, if it hadn't been, you know, Pat, it hadn't even been an economist that was hired into Pat's position. Like, what is it that he, what, what is it that he or Amazon or whatever is making you go transform and become this new version of yourself? There's, there's a lot of factors and I could probably spend an hour on this, but I'll, I'll try to, uh, I'll try to reduce it down to like some key mechanisms and ideas. Um, the first is that Amazon is probably the most data driven company I know. Mm -hmm. They are so focused on measurement, uh, both of things you can directly measure and, but they are so, they were very early interested in economic measurements that are unobservable. Um, either coming from like coming from econometric models that that was whenever Pat demonstrated some of those that was like the light bulb went off mm. the so because again it Amazon was run by and still generally is uh, uh, people with operation science background and so this over index on measuring as as coarsely and as precisely as possible well that's that's economics. <laughs> um, right. So that that was part of it. Uh, another part of it is culturally, Amazon operates and makes decisions based on six page white papers. Uh, you want to make some economists really productive, have them write a six page white paper instead of giving them a presentation, especially to people like who may be in the background with MBAs or other people who have a comparative advantage. We uh, economists have a comparative advantage in writing. So mm -hmm. It was a little bit of like a surprise, but you might hear these anecdotes where it's true. Like whenever you go into a, de a decision making meeting, you come in with your six page white paper that says, here's the business decision to be made. Here is my recommendation. And here's why. And people sit there and it can be a room for five people can be a room of 25 uh, executives. They sit and read the paper and they read the whole thing. Is there an appendices that can go on forever, depending on how big the meeting is? Sure. But that structure of, of data-driven decision-making combined with how you're presenting your arguments is written. Seems like, seems like economists should be pretty good at that, right? Is that a Pat thing? He came up no. with the, work, the working no. paper idea? What no, was the, that? the six pager idea was from Jeff Bezos. And huh. so that was- Would those so, be circulated throughout the, throughout the, the, the firm? Uh, the, the stakeholders who need to be part of the decision making they be circulated but again this is every like everybody's writing six pages powerpoint is basically outlawed at, at amazon and again that happened mid 2000s sometimes so you, people can google it to find out but that six page culture and decision making culture just again fit economists so how is a six page paper similar to the kinds of writing that you know you sort of associate with economists and how is it different so it's, I'll start with the differences. So one with the six page versus like a 30 page academic, you are not going to be able to share the research process. You are not supposed to share the research process. You are supposed to share the clear recommendation and how you got to that recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about like a 30 page academic paper, it can be condensed down into those six pages in my view. They're mm -hmm. just, that's just not how the industry operates, but you probably would know better than mm -hmm. me on that. Um, where but so again where it's the same is again it's a data-driven argument the purpose of this paper the abstract here is the hypothesis that i have that and here's how i tested it and here's how i'm making my conclusion so mm. what i always found really honestly easy was i felt like i was doing the scientific process <laughs> like mm. i felt I, I was with business decision making it generally worked within what is the hypothesis how are we doing this how are we testing it what do we think some alternative conclusions could be, but um, what are we making towards it? So yeah, yeah. again, it, it was closer to what I felt like would be a scientific paper in essence. Mm -hmm. And that whole the day driven mindset is again, that's more, it's very common. I'm not even common at Spotify now. Um, mm. so. Has that been influential throughout, throughout industry? Has it, how, have you noticed Amazon influencing something yeah. that, like most people don't understand? Yeah, there, there's some companies who definitely have completely adopted it. There's some companies who haven't, but the, the six pager 
again, that's this is not a this isn't a concept just to economists and tech. This is a concept that um, is held up as one of the key mechanisms for all of Amazon. Mm, mm, hmm. one, so you, one other. How often yeah. were you writing those? Uh, depends on what level you were. Uh, farther in my career, that's the only thing I did was write six page papers, and it would be part of like my team would help, but. Um, again, anytime you have a key business decision to be made or an update, like you're going to be writing the six page or so. Yeah, it's again that the farther, the more seniority you have, the the more that becomes your job is to communicate, decide, and uh, guide through these business mm -hmm. decisions in these papers. Do they belong to you? They belong to the team because the team, it's always you, it's could always you a like team. put them on a you can't. They're like proprietary, though, to Amazon. Oh, correct. Yeah, no, they they are not publicly available. They're, they're but like, it team. must is it, what's that feel like to do something? What's it What's it feel like to to do something that creative and that kind of like scientific that's siloed within the firm? Does that feel strange? No, it didn't because what it enables is to be able to work on some of the hardest questions without having to worry about uh without having to worry about com communication strategies or, right. or a public press release so no it felt like we were able and this is going back to like some of the things that pat and we did at amazon make successful we worked on some of the hardest problems at mm -hmm. amazon from a very early stage because we said that it wouldn't be publicly available right so that's going to do that and that's so, been a key part yeah because okay i get it okay that that makes a lot of sense yeah so who did you discover then, that you were, go ahead, sorry, Kyle. No, I was going to say maybe the last thing to highlight, because again, I, I, we could probably spend this whole interview on this, but the, the other key mechanism that Pat pioneered was um, the proliferation of economists as a job family was not Pat saying and us saying, go do this. And I can give you my own personal example. It was the other business executives seeing the measurement, seeing the results on product, just saying, okay, I want that. So it really was a demand, aka demand, internal demand mm. for more economists that was going to say, I want this within my business decision making process and want these people who can do this and collaborate across the difference. It was not a, oh, we're going to put economists in a siloed function. It's everybody's going to come here. Um, and that was that was my story. Um, but the very first year, I worked on projects directly for the consumer CFO basically the whole year. It wasn't necessarily by design, but it was what happened. And at the end of the year, year and a half, the, the VP of finance said, come over here and do this with me and come mm -hmm. build. <laughs> come build an economic team and an economic function here within my organization. And that's really is, again, that's the real key was it was business decision makers demanding the ability to understand this and demanding the skill set, just like they would data science, machine learning. So what of the were, demonstrated value. What were they witnessing with their own eyes that was so compelling that they would ink that it would increase demand? Um, so both I'll call it like ad hoc economic analysis on maybe big strategy projects, but also then the introduction of econometric systems into products. Mm, what does that mean? Introduction of econometric systems into products. Um, so say you have a product that is gonna let's go back to the recommender system. Um uh, and I use that again as an abstract, but within there, you might make a change to it. Uh, you might make a change to the recommender system that's going to cause a treatment effect. Right. So, okay, so we can do that one off to estimate that, but you could also then build an economic system that's going to measure those treatment effects and changes like an AB platform or things like that. So uh, maybe people might be more common and familiar with like experimental platforms. This would also be then econometric this would be sub out the a b part of it and sub in an economic model that's going to be doing always on measurement um sometimes at a you know service level so sometimes within like um individual pages sometimes it's going to be at a monthly level but the integration of econometric models into the product right right wow so how are you a different economist because of that experience at amazon if you had to guess what was it, the treatment effect Oh, I mean, it was it was incredibly formative because it to tie, like it put the fit together with the application to where I could understand and really to where it is. My job is to take a business question, turn it into 
a scientific process that can be solved with econometrics and then also be thinking about is this a problem that needs a scalable solution so so amazon taught me business integration taught me so many different languages taught me leadership and management um taught me how to work with stakeholders in collaborative ways but then even more so how to deliver the value through econometric measurement both again as i said not only not only just in ad hoc research papers or one-off analyses but also then where does this fit directly within the products that we build in tech? Yeah. So where'd you go? Seems like people don't stay very long in tech. That's like normal. Whereas like, is, is that right? People kind of like, it, it's less normal to stay your whole career at Amazon. Is that wrong or? I mean, it's got it's still new. So it's probably tough to say that because really the, the field started, uh, like you said, really proliferated in 2012. So. I stayed at Amazon for six years and I thought I'd be staying even longer. Um, but Spotify came with the opportunity to one, work on something I care very deeply about, which is the music industry. I'm a huge mm-hmm. music fan. Um, they also came with the idea to build again. So, mm-hmm. you know, that was the part that really enticed me was Spotify did not have any PhD economists who were in an, an economist role. They had like one in a data science role, but they didn't have the structured economic discipline that they were seeing that Amazon was proliferating and also then going into like Uber, Airbnb and the other tech companies. And so they said, can you build again? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to build. And then last but not least, there's definitely personal considerations here too. And Spotify just really did a great job in showing how the company as a whole has Swedish cultures and values. And at the time I had a nine month old and they said, this is a great place to come be a father with um, the balance and that. And I said, all right, let's make the jump and come to Spotify. And so now I've been here about two years because I I actually went to Spotify in May of 2020. So remind me again, your job title at Spotify. So I'm head of economics. Is that the, is that, is that like chief economist? I I feel like I see different, different job titles and I don't know exactly what, what everything. Yeah, it's on the path to it. So I'm, I'm the highest ranking PhD economist at Spotify. I see. Okay. Yeah. Been there for two uh, years. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, because again, that's what I was brought in to build was to build like we did at Amazon was a overall integration of PhD economists within the different business units. So th- this is the part I'm, I'm having a hard time like, you know, putting visualizing or putting in my own words. What, what exactly will it look like if you have been successful in five years at that goal? And what would it look like if you had been a complete complete bust. What are the two sure. things that are like empirical that I would be able to, to observe? Yeah, a complete bust is probably that um, an economics discipline does not does, is not part of Spotify and it's not, there's not a job family. So a complete bust would have meant I, I moved to Spotify in an, in an economics discipline. Uh, I either work in or I'm working in the data science job. What success looks like is actually what we're, but first from a, so I'll talk about the people in process discipline success. Um, we I came into was real quick cop, so, foundation so, on basically. Yeah. So, so failure actually would mean that the economist community within Spotify just never materialized. Is that what you're saying? And that and that means like this having groups yeah. of economists that that think and use the kinds of training we had in graduate school, but in a way that is actually productive in the firm. Is, is, right. is that is that that's right? right. So, so yeah, and again, that the job m- is successful if you're able to actually create internal demand for economists. Yep, that's right, and okay. that's that's what I would say again from the people process side and then from the product side it's using econometric research in the ways that i've been talking about it's using it both not only for individual analysis but also then building econometric measurement systems that improve the product to get towards spotify's mission of a billion listeners and fans who can connect with over a million creative artists who are making a living so that's Mm -hmm. so it's a combination it's the combination people process do we have the people set up do we have this integrated 
system of economists working alongside all these different types of stakeholders, along with the product side of do we have these measurement techniques that we're applying in a way that is important to Spotify's, not only Spotify's business, but all the stakeholders that have an interest in Spotify. So I feel like, you know, I think to academics the, the, and, uh, and maybe even to some degree students, maybe I'm, maybe I'm completely an outlier here and I'm wrong, but, you know, I, I think there's this like really uh, shallow is a negative word. It, I mean, shallow literally more and just like it's just the thinnest knowledge possible of what exactly, uh, you know, the, the, the core skill set of a successful economist is in tech. You know, um, and for many people, they think, I think they, they think it's such a primitive level. They're like, it needs to be somebody that can code. You know, it's a data scientist, but, but, it, but, it, but that's not what I associate with no. economics. Right. So what, what would you, what would you articulate it is? So it's the ability to do econometric, applied econometric research that's applied to business problems. Mm. So within that is coding. Yes. Uh, right. right. Within the, that is coding. I, the vast majority, I won't say everyone, but the vast majority of tech economists are going to have some level of coding and maybe they're not coding anymore. Like I'm not doing any coding anymore, but mm -hmm. like they, they had that ability. So that's just, again, that's, that's a skill set, but right. the real ability is doing long-term economic research because the questions that we get asked are very hard and difficult. And they are maybe in the academic setting, maybe they are publication worthy. Uh, take that take three years four years to actually solve with the right model yeah. but it's the ability to um take that three-year research roadmap and make iterative progress so when you're doing that you need to have your summary statistics that the business can see understand give feedback on because that accelerates the research process and also accelerates the business impact so mm -hmm. one i guess one comparative skill set that i've learned is what I call research with an open book. You shouldn't really go a month without talking to your stakeholders. You should be showing where the research is. You need to be the person who owns that three-year measurement roadmap, mm. but you're the person who's going to be having to take the feedback at a consistent basis. And that's, that's really the different part. So, but again, that goes back to the applied econometrics part so of it. What is the, so walk me through your, walk me through typical days in your job now. So my typical day, um, is much more generally now on the management people side. So mm -hmm. it's definitely going to be, as I said, building this discipline because we have the creator economics team who's focused on the supply side. Uh, we spun up the um, ads economics team that is a completely separate unit. Again, so that's like part of the people process. But then this creator economics team has a hybrid data science and economics team that's doing all these things that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, Right now, you know, we're working on long-term roadmaps for both product and research and mm -hmm. being there. And then also giving, um, a, I say, honestly, translating a lot of the work that um, the team is doing into the actual business decision making. Mm -hmm. So so I kind of work, if you think of the research process, and I think this is kind of generally true of most managers or at least tech economist managers, they're working at that hypothesis generation and then communication of results, mm -hmm. where then the team itself is working with the data analysis, the statistical models along that research loop to integrate. So it's more of an, my, my role really is an integration of being a translator of economic ability and measurement into the business. So, you know, so you clearly have a comparative advantage uh, evidenced by, you know, your, your successful m m creating of a career, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but I was curious, what do you think your, what do you think that is? You know, how would you explain that to like, you know, like on a subreddit, explain to me like I'm five, how, how would you like explain to, explain to me what you see as your comparative advantage now in life, you know, that you, that you, that you have the, that you're, presence as this value added for the firm. And, and was that it, now that you look back, when you think about who you were as a young person back at UT mm -hmm. or even at Pitt, do you see signs of that? And what, what were the signs? Uh, I mean, yes, I do. Because really my comparative advantage now is, as I mentioned, I seek variety 
And specifically, I seek variety on really hard, interesting problems. Mm. So that's that's going to be it. You can abstract away from the economist role. You can abstract away anything else. But I like to work on things that are hard to solve, um, mm. which is that's going to be valuable in so many different contexts. And then specifically in the economist frame, again, we're, we're probably comparing to other economists. I'm much more of a variety seeker. So mm. I want to work on a variety of problems. And I mean, there are people up, that are not like that. I time. mean, right. So there'd be people who are going to be much more focused on changing the methodology for, I mean, Scott, you work in causal inference. You tell me, what are you, what are you working on? <laughs> that's going to be changing uh, some sort of estimator, right? right? That's That just doesn't hold that much appeal to me. I'll say it. What does appeal to me is disentangling a problem, making it less, making a super ambiguous problem solvable. Right. And then um having people dive in and solve that so yeah, yeah. The, i guess the reddit theme variety seeking on ambiguous problems it's funny you know like maybe you heard at some point in your career i'm just guessing someone or i could imagine someone saying you're not focused yeah I did. and and in fact uh that might have been true and really not relevant Right. Well, like a, it, a it, it was probably it was probably relevant feedback to certain end goals. But again, once I once I realized what the end goals were, it's all of this to tie it all together. All this led up to where an economist in tech is exactly where yeah. I was. I was meant to be. I'll say in quotes. Right. Right. Well, you know, I think like one thing that I I feel like is really positive about the the growth of the of tech. And in, in many ways, I see now at, at universities are now in direct competition with tech. And I, and I wouldn't, I don't think that was true 50 years ago that maybe, uh, maybe universities were in competition with government. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if that was exactly like it is now, you know, and um, it, it seems like what I see with you is, is a person who, who, who took ownership of their life, right? And just sort of said, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it, but it seems like one of the things that it's like, you know, I think young people can be encouraged by or should hear is that, you know, here's a person that took ownership of their life. This was their career. It's the only life they had. This was their career. And they, they, they had the fortitude and the resilience. And the you know to to be themselves and make a career, is that true? You think? I appreciate you saying it, and it's probably true. Uh, again, I kind of like hesitate because again, during in my twenties in the searching phase, it definitely didn't feel that way. Didn't feel that way, right? But now in the decade of my thirties, yeah, it did because. Uh, but I was I was more than willing to explore different avenues because yeah. that's what because I wasn't I wasn't willing to settle. I guess I'll say that like mm -hmm. I wasn't willing to settle for something that I didn't feel was the right fit for me. Yep. And so that, that's what a big driver that's been able to help me get here for sure. Yep. Yep. I think that, I think that the truth is economics is a really valuable PhD and it supports a, uh, it, it supports many personalities with me. It, it, and it, but you know, like I do think sometimes one of the skills of that, of people that are in that stage of searching, is just to be able to be to wait yep. you know you're like that so you don't always know that you're planting seeds and and you know you can't harvest seeds when they're seeds you know you can't harvest plants when they're seeds you have to yeah. wait yeah but you have to be disciplined and continue to water it too though okay. yeah and also be, be willing to take some risks once in a while and willing to take it. some calculated but, risks yeah. but yeah specifically like for tech economists now there is a lot more information and i, I will say probably five years ago I probably cautioned some people from going to get their PhD in economics if they wanted to be a tech economist because mm -hmm. it was still, you know, the majority of people who jumped into it were risk takers willing to do that. There wasn't this, but now I believe um, the head of NAVE has said that there's over 1,500 economists in tech now. We have a great conference that we spun up while we were, uh, while, while I was at Amazon that I was a part of that now NAVE Tech in November. So if people want to learn, now the ability is there. So in grad yeah. school, like come to Nave Tech, come see, come look at the program, come see exactly because it was it's a conference that's 
designed by tech economists for tech yeah, economists. Susan business. mentioned it too. NABE, National Association of Business Economics. I actually, it's a huge conference and I actually don't think in academia a lot of people know about it. Yeah. Because we that's just know about the ASSA. Right. And that's one of the reasons I kind of wanted to plug it here, honestly, because again, it, it, it started out probably 50 people, I forget what year, but now it's up to, I, mean, I think they're expecting over 500. And so mm -hmm. that is, so some of this discovery and searching that if people, if people who are in their PhD want to learn more about, that's going to be the best place. I only have two more questions and then I'm going to let you go. One of them is kind of touchy feely, but, um, <laughs> okay. so, so, and I, and I, I'll just admit, as I ask this question, you're going to immediately know I must think this way. And so that does not mean that you think this way, but you know, I love being an economist. I love economics. I love being an economist. And if I was to go get a job and the job title said, didn't say economist on it, I would be, I would feel, I, I can already tell that would be something I would have to work through because I feel so connected to the tribe. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, you know, do you think that economists in tech feel connected to the tribe? Um, it, it gets to which tribe? Do you think they feel like a part of the broader American Economics Association? My, I'll say my personal view is probably not, because that's not the colleagues that we've grown up with over the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. Do we feel part of the tech economist community? Yes, there is one. <laughs> there very much is one. And do we feel part of that tribe? Very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Do I feel part of the academic economist tribe? Probably not. Yeah. Um, but to tie it all together, like, do I feel like I'm an economist? Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. And again, we're making differentiations probably for your audience, but in the grander scheme of things, uh, if you look at, if you look at, uh, anybody in tech who's an economist, they're going to, to non-economists, they're, they're economists. They're economists. Right? Yeah. They, 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 they think different. Yeah. I mean, I'll give a quick anecdote. Like one of my, one of my good friends and colleagues at Amazon, Neil Ghosh, is not there anymore. Um, his wife and my wife just would always be like, they just respond to the, the question in the exact same way. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so it's like they very, very much are just so rational with their responses in yeah. general. You know, there's exceptions, but they <laughs> they would compare notes and we'd have the same general view and outlook yeah. on personal finances, let's say. So, yeah. Yeah. but I think what you're hitting at is, is there different tribes that are growing up? Yeah, because I think there's probably always been different tribes. And so tech economists is a tribe that is, I mean, is more than growing up. And again, mm -hmm. we think there's probably going on 2000 of them and there's very strong connections within that. Yeah, I guess I wonder sometimes I'm like, what's the point? The point is community. Mm -hmm. the point is not for the, the, the goal is not for the AEA to have everybody. The goal is for, you know, I think the goal is for people to thrive and feel connected to their broader, to a broader community. And if that's grown endogenously in tech, that's good. I just always kind of think to myself, like, but at the end of the day, the universities are staffed by faculty in the AEA. And it, it just seems like, and so it's like, it, it seems like at the graduate training, you know, many people can feel job dissatisfaction because they know they're not going to become an academic, you know, and that, that can be, a, that might be a source of some of the struggles. There's a new paper in the general economic literature about uh, mental health struggles amongst PhD students in economics. And there mm -hmm. was, you could, if you read between the lines, if you read between the lines, there was a real disconnect between them and their advisor. They, the, the, the you know, you don't know causality because it was just a survey, but like, you know, the, the students were like, they just seemed to have job dissatisfaction. They didn't think their work mattered, you know? And, and I just kept thinking in my mind, you know, do they know about all their options? Are any of those options stigmatized? You know, because like if you are only, if you've held it up to students that the only meaningful career that you could possibly have is at a is tenured at a at a university writing papers that get into top fives, and you and you sense inside your heart, you know, that just I don't think that that's that's not doing it. Yeah. 
I think it ties together what you said earlier that economics welcomes a whole bunch of different viewpoints and worldviews, but maybe doesn't reward the diversity the way it should in mm-hmm. academic economics. And so, like from a diversity viewpoint, these are different career paths, but even more so should welcome more ideas. So, like that's probably where the economic field needs to continue to lean in is mm-hmm. with this diversity to enable people to not to know different paths to raise up people on different paths and have those opportunities. And yeah. I think tech is providing a huge pathway for that. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I am very grateful for it. It seems really exciting. It seems like a world of just like working on, I'm sure that the way we think about, uh, you know, Gossett at Guinness uh, coming up with the, you know, student's tea of this story of a, of a person in industry making these major contributions. We're just at the beginning of, of that you know, with just the sheer volume of, of social scientists in tech working on fascinating, important topics. My last question, what is your favorite paper in economics? Or no, let me say it this way. What is a paper in economics that, that has, that has for some reason stuck it, that is stuck around in your head? Uh, BLP. So, Yeah, it it has because that was probably the first time that I felt like the wow moment of we can we can estimate substitution effects with observational data. Don't Mm -hmm. need experiments. We have this method that obviously has proliferated into so many different ways. And that stuck with me because throughout all my stops, I've generally been super interested in substitution effects. So, yeah, yeah, I would put that in that research thread. Um, yeah, I, I I don't think that that's that you having that empirical IO structural, uh, you know, having rent in your head, mm-hmm. yeah. right, right. That's great. Well, it is a real pleasure uh, to to get to walk through. I appreciate you walking me through your your life and telling me about your your career. Um, it's really a nice pleasure to meet. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I really appreciate the form. 